and this is lesson 9-4, and we're solving polynomial equations in factored form. We are right now on page number 575. I'd recommend you go there, all right? Um, again, we're going to start off with a little bit of vocabulary. What does it mean? Now, when they have this title to this section, factored form, what is factored form? Well, factored form means you have a product. For example, x plus 2 times x minus 3 equals 0 is an equation written in factored form because I have a product. I have two things multiplied together. Factored form actually goes back to things you would have learned, uh, heck, in, in third grade. Take the number 6 and think about it. If you break 6 up into 2 times 3, you just factored 6. This is factored form. The factors of 6 are 2 and 3. So factored form is just a fancy way of saying when we break something up into a multiplication, uh, we, we have factored it basically, all right? Can you see the factors in my example? I have x plus 2 times x minus 3. These are factors. I have a product. What happens when a product equals 0? Think about that. Like here, what happens when these two multiplied out give me 0? Think about that for a second. You might want to pause the video. When you multiply two things together and their product is 0, that tells me that one of these two things must actually be zero because isn't anything times zero, zero. So, for example, up here, if this works out to zero, one of these two things, one of these two um, factors, I guess should be the mathematical way to say it, one of these two factors should actually work out to zero. Go to page 578 right now and look at question number nine. Number nine says to solve the equation. So I notice I have two factors being multiplied together and they equal zero. Well, that tells me one of two things. If this equals zero, then either m minus three has to w work out to zero or four m minus 12 has to equal zero. Well, let's solve for each. What values of m will either make this zero or this factor zero? So basically I have two little equations to solve. For m minus 3 to equal 0, there's not much work there. We know m must be 3. For 4m plus 12 to equal 0, all I'd need to do is take away 12 from each side first, which would give me 4m equals negative 12, and then I can divide each side by 4, and m would equal negative 3. This is probably the first time, maybe in algebra or any math, you have a you have an equation that gives you two solutions. Normally we've had one, none, or infinitely many. Here we actually have two. If m equals three, if you plug in a three here, this will work out to zero, and zero times anything is zero. And if m works out to negative three, then this factor would equal zero, and whatever this is times zero would equal zero. So again, probably the first time in, in math, you have two solutions. Now, when you look at the top of page 576 and look at example two, they're going to ask you to factor out the greatest monomial factor. Um, you might remember back uh, greatest common factor using that term um, when we talked about two numbers. Uh, here would be an example of greatest common factor. This would be, again, stuff from that you would have learned back in probably sixth grade. Take the numbers, let's say, um, let's take the numbers 24. I've got to turn this layer on. Let's take the numbers 24 and 16. Okay? When they're asking for the greatest common factor, they're asking what's the biggest number that will divide into 24 and 16 evenly? And when we think about that, well, I can divide 24 by 8, and I can divide 16 by 8. Eight's the biggest number. One will divide into both, so will two. Four divides into both, so does eight evenly. Um, that's, there's the greatest common factor, okay? Um, that applies to what we're going to do here when they ask us to factor out the greatest monomial factor. What they're asking you to do is basically apply what I learned here, but apply it to algebraic expressions. That means it might have variables in it. 
factoring, I kind of think of it as the exact opposite in a way of distributing. Sometimes I think of factoring almost as undistributing, even though there is no such word as undistributing. Okay? For example, here would be a good, good example. Look at number 17, and they want me to factor out the greatest monomial factor of 2x and 2y. So I'm kind of thinking I want to undistribute this. So there's two terms, 2x and 2y. What can I pull out of each? Well, you notice both of these have a 2. If I kind of undistribute the 2 and pull that 2 out and I get 2 times x plus y, I've just factored this. Now, do you notice if I take 2 and I redistribute it, 2 times x is 2x and 2 times y is 2y, does it make sense that factoring 2x plus 2y must equal then 2 times x plus y? All right. The most common mistake I hear people make is on this, I'll do this in red, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm pulling out a 2 and I'm pulling out another 2, and 2 and 2 is 4, so I'm really pulling out a 4. But think about this. If I redistribute the 4, do I get right back to here? And obviously I don't, I get this. Okay, so you're just unfactoring a 2. Just like when you distribute the 2 through, you've just kind of done that reverse process. So when you look at 19, and we have 3s to the 4th times 16s, I'm trying to figure out what's my common factor. Well, 3 and 16, there's no numerical amount that I can pull out because 3 and 16, there's nothing in common. I can divide 3 by 3, but I can't divide 16 evenly by 2. There's no common numerical factor. But do you notice how each of these have at least s? There's s here, and I have s to the 4th here. So if I factor out the s, if I pull out an s from both, if I pull out one s from each term, so that's why you can see I pulled out one s, I'm still left with 3s cubed plus 16. Now think, if I redistribute this, if I redistributed the s through, I'd have 3s to the fourth plus 16s, just like I have here. That's called factoring out a greatest common monomial factor. And another place you can look for more examples of that, if you look on page 576, example number two, there's two more examples of that you might want to look through. We'll do one more here, 21. I'm looking for the greatest monomial factor to factor out. Do you notice, well, 7 and 35 have a common factor. I can divide 7 by 7, and I can divide 35 by 7, so I can definitely pull out a 7. So there's my 7. But you notice I have two factors of w here and five more factors here. I can pull out two factors of w from each. So when I pull out 7w squared from each, I'm left with 1w cubed here and just negative 5 here. Now think about it. If I redistribute it, if I took this times this and this times this, I do get 7w to the fifth minus 7 times 5 is 35 minus 35w squared. So I'm, I'm really doing just the opposite of distributing when I factor. Let's talk about solving second degree equations. That's something they're going to ask you to do in questions 27 to 38. They show you some examples of solving second degree equations at the bottom of page 576. Again, I would suggest you look over example 3 and 4 on the bottom of page 576. What is a second degree equation? A second degree equation means you have a variable in your equation to the second power in it. Like this. How do I solve a second degree equation? We're going to have to apply what you learned earlier in the video right here when I was solving a factored form equation. What I need to do in second degree equations is I have to put them in factored form first. So first off, write the equation. Make sure all variables are on one side of the equation, okay? And make sure the other side in this case is going to equal zero which is already the case in this problem. The next thing, 
find the greatest common factor to factor out or undistribute. You notice both of these terms have B in it. So I'll pull out a B. I'll factor out B from each, and, I'm, and that gives me B, and I'm still left with B plus 6. Does it make sense if I redistribute it, I'd get right back to here. Okay, now think about this. This times this, these two factors multiply out to 0, which means one of these two things must, one of these two factors have to work out to 0. So for B to work out to 0, B would actually have to be 0. For B plus 6 to work out to 0, well, take away 6, B would have had to have been a negative 6. So my solution to the problem would be B equals 0 or B equals negative 6. And as always, you can always check it. Let's try it. If I put a 0 in here, I get 0 plus, or I'm sorry, if I put a 0 in here, I get 0 times 6. That's definitely 0. And if I plug in a negative 6, I get negative 6 times nothing. Well, that's still 0. So I can always check these. Let's do one more. 33. You notice how all my variables are not on one side of the equation. So that's the first step. Get all my variables on one side. Take away 6k from each side. Now remember, I cannot subtract these. They're not like terms. This has squared. This does not. So I have all my variables and everything on one side, zero on the other. Now I'm looking for a common factor. I notice that I can divide 3 and 6 both by 3 and I can pull out a k from both. Now remember, if that's confusing you, think about it. If you take 3k times k, you get right back here. And if you take 3k times 2, you get right back here. Well, this factor times this factor equals 0, which means one of these factors have to equal 0. For 3k to equal 0, k would have to be a 0. For k minus 2 to equal 0, k would have to be a 2. So I have two solutions, 0 and 2, and of course I ought to check it. There's a vertical motion model that we need to know, and you can find that vertical motion model on page 577. Let me write that down. Okay, this is a model that you are, ha you are going to have to remember. This applies what we've learned to real-life situations. Okay, you'll have to remember this model. It's h equals negative 16 t squared plus vt plus s. You will see it in the blue box. It will say vertical motion model on page 577. Here's what all of these different variables represent. First of all, h represents height in feet. So that's what h is, just the height in feet. t represents time in seconds, so these t's. This is time, and this is time. V is the initial velocity of the object in feet per second. So whatever the initial velocity of the object is, um, that's what V here in the formula represents. And finally, um, S is the starting height at takeoff, the starting height at takeoff for the object. All right? So... All these things are what goes into the vertical motion model. Well, what does the vertical motion model do? Whenever you have a projectile, like let me make up something. A baseball bat hits a baseball, and let's say the ball is hit right here, and it flies in the air, and it hits the ground here. This model can be used for the following. It could find the amount of time the ball was in the air. Um, it could find the initial velocity of when the ball was hit. It could find the starting height at takeoff, or it could find the height of the ball at any time in feet. So that's what, the vertic that's what vertical motion represents, a projectile. All right? It could be like a rocket being launched. So when you look, and I just, let me uncover these. Let's go to problem 51, and it's a story problem. Let's look at, and let's use the vertical motion model for problem 51. It says, a cat leaps from the ground into the air with an initial velocity of 11 feet per second. After how many seconds does the cat land on the ground? So here's what we'd need to do there. First of all, the cat is leaping from the ground, so its starting height is zero. So I can put a zero in here. The cat in the problem has an initial velocity of 11 feet per second. I can write an 11 in for V. I want to figure out when does the cat land on the ground. 
Well, think about it. When the cat lands on the ground, it is zero feet off the ground, which means I can plug in a zero here. Well, let's write that out. I have zero for height equals negative 16 t squared plus 11 t plus zero. I don't need to write the plus zero. I just have to solve this. Okay, all I need to do is solve it. Well, this is exactly like the kind of questions we were doing from numbers 27 to 38. So I'm looking for a common factor. Well, 16 and 11 do not have a common factor, but I have a t I can pull out of each term. So I'll factor out a t. Now I have, I, have a, I have a product of factors now. Okay, do you see the product? This times this is zero, which means one of these have to be zero. So either t has to be zero or negative 16t plus 11 would have to work out to zero. So if this works out to zero, I can take away 11 from each side, divide by negative 16, and I'm getting t equals 11 16 seconds. Now, the question is, how long was the cat in the air? Well, the answer can't be zero seconds. What this means is when the cat first leaped, that process occurred at zero seconds. In other words, there's two times the cat was touching the ground. At zero seconds when the cat first leaped, and at 11 16 seconds when the cat landed on the ground. There is my correct answer. The cat must have landed after the leap 11 16 seconds later. Let's do number 52, same kind of thing. It says we have a spittle bug jumps in the air with an initial velocity of 10 feet per second. Write an equation that gives the height of the spittle bug as a function of the time in seconds since it left the ground. Well, first of all, the initial velocity is 10 feet a second, and the spittle bug jumped from the ground. There's a function that will show the height of the spittle bug at any time during its leap. It says the spittle bug reaches its maximum height after 0.3125 seconds. How high can it jump? I'm looking for the height. Now, do you notice they just gave us the time? They just told us the time was 0.3125 seconds. All I need to do is plug those times in for t and calculate this out. And I did that on the next slide anyway. Okay, so calculating that out, all I'd have to do is take negative 16 in my calculator times 0.3125 and square it. And I'll add on 10 times 0.3125. As soon as my pen unfreezes, I'll complete that. and that will equal the height of the spittle bug at that time, okay? And that's where I'm going to stop my video. I'll let you actually put that in your calculator and calculate it out. Um, if you have any questions, we can go through those tomorrow.